way. It was as if he thought they put up a field around it or something to protect it. Um, fast forward. Oh, and then it goes away. I believe north, but don't worry about the detail. That's not a detail. It's important, I think. Um, three days later, he starts to get sick. Oh, man. And he loses body weight. And not just him, but 70, over 70 men in his group had to be ambulanced out. They had to bring in bulldozers and, and put in roads for the match, jeeps and ambulances to come in. Took him out to, and the other men out to uh, a mash unit behind the lines for treatment. Um, and he got a medical discharge. I wrote to the Army Records Department in St. Louis and gave their names, serial number and rank and all that. And sure enough, here's his name on this list. And behind his name in pen writing, someone had written in evacuated to field hospital, just like he said. Yeah. So there's verification. Yeah. And you go down the rest of the men in his group that from that day evacuated to field hospital. It's about 70 names. Just like he said. You said 70? I think 70. Holy mackerel. Yeah. Well, okay, that's half the story. Oh, great. <laughs> because well, what you gonna... read in here, you see, what happened was he made the initial response. He shot at it, right? Yeah. The question is, what did it do in return? Yes. I just told you, right? Yes. Well, there's a second case that is identical to that. It happened years later. Somewhere in Arkansas, somewhere down Tennessee, that part of southeastern America, a couple hunters were out. Foggy morning, I think they were looking for ducks. Well, something else came over, it wasn't a duck, and they fired a shotgun at the bottom of whatever this oh, big thing was. A shotgun, that's, that's and, a different uh, ammo. And they, yeah. in their report, they described the object does the same thing. Same thing as, as the as Korean object. Tries to evade it initially. Yeah, not yeah. initially. It changes brightness. Okay. Then it does this, right? Yeah, yeah. And then this sound comes out of it. And oh, like, really? Oh, okay. Oh. And then a light comes out of it. Is the time frame difference of that? A couple, a couple of years, as I recall. Maybe 10 years, even. Got it. So the, the logical question in my mind is, did, did these two hunters ever find out about Wall's earlier K Korean event. No, I can't find the, any reason to, to support that. To determine if they were just mimicking yeah, what Yeah, making what it up said. for some reason. Yeah, right? yeah. If you were going to make up something like that, would you mimic that? How would you know? No. Uh, did they have get sick also? Oh, good no, question. They did. No, I don't think they did. I don't recall that in the report. And were Could, the men that got sick, were they healed? <laughs> Wall told me that he has he lost like 40, 50 pounds and he never gained it back. The implication is radiation, but we don't yeah, know. We yeah. don't know. We don't know. You actually interviewed him yourself yeah, personally. Sure. Wow. Yeah, good case. Yeah. <clears throat> so anyway, that, to me this is an important work that has never caught on. Nobody seems to know about it. That's okay. That's their problem, not mine. Yes. I did my part. You did your work. And but it raises the question, is there intelligence behind the phenomenon? And that's a key question. Yeah. From a science point of view, that's a key question. Well, I think we would love to hear any more anecdotal evidence that you have in your book that would just kind of open it to clarify there we go kind of pick a good page and and and, okay. and peak his memory all right oh chapter four ufo responses to overtly hostile human behavior good job oh all right very good mary 58 cases oh, wow. 58. in that chapter alone chapter four 58 chapter four cases. right okay just pick um, pick a couple all right you want me to just read it? Yeah, that'd be fine. It'd be wonderful. All right. Having the book that you wrote read by the author. Can't beat that. Okay, here's a case. Happened in 1988, early in the year. Uh, a city councilman and a rancher and an auto parts store owner, Antonio Fernandez Duarte, 43 years old, 
admitted the following during an interview in 1991 in Mossoro, Brazil. This happened in Brazil. Okay. Quote, I was fascinated by them. I didn't know what to do. I had a revolver. I wanted to shoot uh, at the alien being to see their reaction, but I didn't. Okay. That's fundamentally his report. Yeah. Here's what I wrote. Nevertheless, it is irrational for someone to initiate hostility with something which very probably, possibly could be far more militarily advanced. You don't pick on somebody bigger than you, and right? since they're here in spaceship, that's a gift. <laughs> yeah, okay. Um, yeah, exactly. We are taught in childhood to pick on someone our own size. <laughs> to do otherwise invites a retribution we may not like. But, as we shall see in this chapter, humans don't always act rationally. <laughs> you can quote me on That's that. That's a good understatement <laughs> right there. Okay. Wow. Fortunately, there are instances where humans do act responsibly. <laughs> Thank goodness. Okay. Attracting attention. At least one in one case, a hunter fired his shotgun at a UFO which was flying past him in order to attract it to come back. <laughs> <laughs> That's hilarious. Isn't that great? It's like He's a brave man. The ultimate trap shoot right there. <laughs> shoot you and I'll come back. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Wow. Okay. That's, that's irrational. This failed. <laughs> it does say. It didn't come back. This okay. failed. Uh, the hunter and his companion tried to follow the object in their truck for several miles, but the object simply flew out of sight giving off a steady humming sound, okay? So that's obviously a close encounter. Yeah. If they're sure hearing is. the sound and if they're able to follow it at least a, for a while <laughs> in the truck. Yeah, well, I just, if you're interested in the subject, this is a quick way, to, I noticed you got a copy. It's a quick way to catch up on these interesting cases. It's yeah. What you do, the conclusions you draw from this are up to you, obviously. You've got to come to your own point of view on this. Don't take yeah. mine. You know. Do you have any reports of abductions in your book? Um, no, this is not. I studiously avoided abductions. <laughs> but um, what is your book written, actually? Huh? Yes. Um, yeah. Because I know you've written many, many books, uh, and I was wondering how far back you were writing pu- about CE5. It was published in 1999. Oh, oh my gosh. Uh, but I wrote it for two years up to then. So yes. 1997. How do you get an alien to notice you? In, a in other words, in, <laughs> in other words, what what was your conclusion on uh, people potentially being able to attract attention or whatever? I don't understand the question. Well, the question is like... Uh, how did they Doc- get an alien to come and notice them? Doc- Dr. Greer says he has some kind of protocol. Right. You know, where he uh, does meditation right. and they have, right. um, I think they have tones and things that mm-hmm. they use. Have you come across anything like that that would, that would show that people actually can <clears throat> um, initiate contact? Them. Yeah. That's a, that's a key question. It's a fundamental question. I don't have the answer. Yeah. That's a research question. You, sir, have the answer because we've done it. Well, and go ahead, uh, Lee, if you would like to jump in because this is not a one-way conversation here. We're we're having a good time today, so go ahead. So up at Mount Baker, we were at Artist Point, you, me, and a couple other people. Lean forward a little bit. And we yeah, s- you got to lean forward a little bit. There you go. So we saw... Um, a light in the distance, you know, that wasn't there. And Michael had his his binoculars, and he's looking, and it's like, well, there's a couple of them over there. And no, Bruce, let, let us explain. We're, we we are familiar with the night sky right. above Mount Adams, right? Because Mount Baker. M- Mount Baker, I'm sorry, because we um, we had been there for hours, right? 
So we know exactly the star clusters and that were out that night. Right. Then all of a sudden we find something that's very big mm -hmm. that wasn't there before. Right. That's what happened. And there was a couple of them apparently. I was just looking through my camera and, and the monitor, so I was basically, you know, had all that bright light in my eyes, so I really couldn't see off in the distance what Michael was looking at. I was just using my camera to kept capture everything and we were all standing there watching this thing and you could tell that it was pulsating pulsating in, in this bluish color and we're like okay well, let's see you know let's see if it'll change colors and it changed colors and we asked it to flash and then it would flash <laughs> so this is pretty uh, dramatic yeah so um and this is we weren't using flashlights or anything like that we're just talking you know to it and it's reacting to what we we ask it to do it would do of course we were concentrating on this thing with our eyes yeah. the whole time so i mean if there's any way to focus your thoughts in a direction we were we were definitely we were doing, doing that so. yeah so Who knows? So um, there was, I think there was four different things we asked it to do, and it would do it. And the sighting lasted. Flare up. Yeah, flare up, and then and then um, we asked it to flash, and it, so it turned off, and then it flashed up again. Um, it did, uh, yeah, the change color. It. Perfect. You have this on tape. Yes, I do. Yep. Digital. Yep. Video. So, right. Um, Pretty fascinating. And then what? There was another thing that we did that we that it did. I could, I can't remember what it was, but anyway, it was just the most fascinating thing, and it lasted for over a half an hour. I mean, of this, um, um, from the time that we first saw it to um, you know when we asked it to start doing things, and it did. I mean, it was just it was amazing. May I jump in with a sure. comment? Sure. Yeah. Um, for those of us who have these kind of confirmatory experiences, mm -hmm. let me suggest a hypothesis, to, just to think about, that we're being initiated. You know what an initiation is? There you go. You go to a sorority or a fraternity and you have to go through a series of stuff, tests if you will, procedures, legal stuff or whatever, to prove yourself. Amazing. What if the encounters we're talking about are really a form of initiation into something new? Uh, <clears throat> yeah. I've thought about that in yeah. my own research with abductees for a long time. Interesting. And I have to ask myself, if that's true, what am I getting inducted into? Yeah. Because I didn't ask for it. Right. In other I words, didn't sign up to become a Alpha Psi or whatever on right, the campus. You're, you're yeah. wondering what kind of fraternity this is, you That's know? Right. Huh. That's amazing. I, Alpha yeah, they're Centauri. introducing me into a sorority. <laughs> right. Yeah, it could be the other right. That wouldn't right. be too bad. <laughs> a galactic sorority. I like that. <laughs> right. um, and also the idea that maybe once you've been initiated somehow with this kind of contact that they they recontact you potentially there are a lot of cases like that sure, sure. matter of fact i've even heard the idea of uh generational yeah. contact right um, there was a conference held at mit years ago uh dave pritchard put it on and I submitted a paper for that conference on this very subject. Oh, did you? I now. didn't know that you were involved in that MIT conference. That's well, a, that gave, was a famous conference. I gave four papers there. Wonderful. But the point is that there are research ways that you should do this genetic, generational is a better word, generational links one to one to one to one to one. Really? Without muddying the waters, without him involving or imputing your own biases into it yeah, um, yeah very important to do that from a science point of view yeah otherwise you just end up listening to yourself and that's, yeah. that's pretty dangerous you know? <laughs> no i like you the way you've always done that uh, dick you, you you've been the scientific voice of ufology for many many years that was uh, important you know um somebody's got to do it someone's <laughs> got to keep us on track <laughs> What's your yeah. opinion of what they want from us? You know, that could be answered lots of different ways. I think my most consistent answer to that 
that's a good question. Is that they're neutral? They're if they're real and if they're alien. It's all if. They're probably anthropologists doing research, and they're trying to uh, collect data without being collected. <laughs> they want to sample us without us sampling them, or or being too. Um in the prime directive kind of deal right, right. Of not exactly wanting to involve to right. change things right. here on the planet i don't right. know right um yeah and how if, if they're anthropomorphic in the sense of a projection of ourselves right which yeah. has been a common science fiction theme for a long time yeah then we would expect over the eon well decades of good research to see ourselves like a mirror image because it's anthropomorphic Projection, yeah. But if they're totally novel, yeah, yeah, new creations from God or somewhere else in the universe, they're going to be different. Yeah, you see, I, I think uh, I can't prove that. It would just seem to me that it be would, different. It would be. I mean, the odds would be astronomical that they would be the same. Right. Let's let's put it that way. I think so. That's right. Well, unless you can't spare me, unless you're sure. With that. Yeah. Right. Right. Yeah, and then we'd all share the same DNA. Yeah. Pretty nice. At least in this yeah. Or... Right. The um. At one at one point, I don't know if you have to do this now, but we would like to get some information about this sighting report that you've been studying on Woodby Island as well. Okay. Uh, that is not too far out of our neck of the woods, sure. but we might be able to come over and pick your brain and use okay. your expertise in an investigation uh yeah i can in general terms but i can't mention any names sure i don't have their permission mm -hmm. i understand okay i'll give you a and thumbnail of course we would be totally um uh you know uh, into that as well as far as keeping uh, right. their names anonymous if they wanted if to if they need to yeah. if they wanted to be involved in a sure in a an investigation that we would do okay. yeah i think it's an interesting there's two separate sets of witnesses by the way okay uh i'll start at the first one women age 16 high school buddies uh, Coopville High School. Um, they live uh, on adjacent farms. Are you familiar with Coopville at all on the island? Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Okay, good. Beautiful country. Yeah. Uh, one's the daughter of this family over here, farming family, fence separating the next family up here, the daughters of that family, right? They're good friends. How far away do you think? Those From what? Those, those two uh, witnesses or two farms. From each they other. share a fence. Okay. How but far it, is that? Is it 160 acres? Is oh, it like, you how know, big is the farm? How how big are the, the how far apart are these neighbors? You mean the houses? The yeah. houses don't fit. So okay, but what do you the witnesses. How far away were the witnesses from, from each other? They were together. Okay. Okay. Were now together. we're talking. I understand. <laughs> All right. Got it. Uh, they had the, the families set the rule that when dinner time came, six o'clock, they had to be home for dinner. They didn't get fed. This is the good old days, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, it got to be close to six o'clock, and they agreed that they would walk each other for safety reasons to the fence line between their two properties from wherever they'd been playing and then each walk back to their homes for dinner okay okay makes good sense uh, and having been there photograph take measurements and all this and interview both of them um, I can tell a lot of details because it's now been built up. The, the families later on sold property to a, a developer, a housing developer, and put houses in there. Oh, wow. Right. So it's not farming fields anymore. Yeah. Mm. And the event happened in 1967, 68. So it's, a lo it's an old case, oh, right? Yeah. Uh, just about six o'clock, the two girls are pretty much ready to go back to home to dinner. And they notice a silver oblate spheroid, maybe something like this. They drew separate drawings. Okay. Uh, with lights around the circumference, like this. They weren't moving lights, they were just lights. Okay. E Got it. Evenly spaced. At a low altitude, hovering silently. Maybe 50 feet above the ground, 100 feet above the ground. Wow. They were 
At first, they weren't too scared because there's a naval air station just north of there, about sure. three miles, and they might have been flying some new vehicle of some kind. You know, you kind of see strange, strange stuff militarily. But what got them afraid was it didn't make any noise. It wasn't a helicopter, in other words. Yeah. They knew that much. Yeah. So the grass was like three, two feet deep at that time. Okay. And they got scared and they crunched down in the grass to see them. Uh huh. And it kept peeking up and watching this thing. It, I, I need a. No. Just happen to have a pad oh, and pen, pen right here. All right. Because this is important. All okay, right. I'll bet. Here's the water line. Here's, here's Puget Sound, right? Here's, here's the farm. Here's one of the houses. This is another house. And they're meeting right about there. Okay? Got it. So one of the girls is going to go back to this house, and the other girl is going to go to this house. And when this happens, they're pretty much near the fence line, she said. Both of them said. Here's the object approximately there. Okay. Is, that the, is that the water that it's uh, right close to the edge of the water? Ah, this is a bank about 50 feet high that's pretty well vertical down to the, the beach line. P Puget Sound. In Puget other Sound. Here's the beach. Okay, got it. What did the object do? It did this. It flew away from them, opposite direction, and then dropped down out of sight over the cliff. Ah. Okay. It went away from, here they are there, it went away from them and then dropped down, disappeared. End of story. That's, that's all they remember. They ducked down, so it ducked down. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Very good, Steve. I That's like good. that. That's good. Uh, they ran home, told their parents. Their parents laughed at them, and they said, "No, we're not going to tell anybody else anymore." Except this gal, who I know personally, uh, she goes to our church in, in Oak Harbor. She told me that the next day she went to school. Uh, and told her teacher about what had happened to them. Teacher said, well, let's do a writing project on it. So this girl wrote up a couple pages, thank goodness. Wow. A lot of details in there that would be long gone now if she waited about what had happened, right? This is approximately 1967, somewhere in there. How old was she? 16. They were both 16 at the time. Um, the next story, that's, I, I think I could talk them into meeting with you guys. I don't know, but I think that me wow. and you could do an interview. I can't guarantee that. Yeah. Um, fast forward about a mile and a half north up the coast. Oops, oh, here. Up to the north here. On the, the same coastline now. Yeah. We have <clears throat> two mothers in the front seat of a station wagon and six kids in the back and they're coming home from the naval air station where they had watched a, a movie their husbands were in the navy station in the navy and they had privileges on the base so they saturday they take the kids to the movies on the base they were driving home uh, from the movies the sun was about a hand's breadth above the horizon off to the west here Clear night, same weather as this, by the way. Um, and the driver is coming west. All right. <laughs> Here's the coastline here. All right. Um, how do I do this? West. There. This is about a mile inland when the object is first seen. Right here, okay. Objects for this is the car on the, the car on the highway right here. This is a gravel road, uh, 25 to 30 mile an hour speed limit at the time. The driver sees an object right here, a silver oval with light with lights around the edge, about that far away over a field, and she jams on the brakes and she says, what's that? And everyone in the car sees it. And then she says, shall we chase it? 
And everybody says, yeah, let's chase it. <laughs> so she, she does, and she drives down this road here at high speed, turns a corner down here, as the object starts to go away. The object does this. Okay? And it stops right here. So they chase the object, can you see that? Towards the beach, about a mile, roughly a mile. The road turns here along West Beach Road, and then it stops and hovers at like a 45 degree angle. Um, sun's still about a hand's breadth above the horizon. And they pull off right here in a little parking area, which is still there, by the way. They don't want to get underneath it, but they, they, they stop about here, about three or 400 yards to the north of where it is. They all get out of the car to see it better, and then they don't remember too much after that. Oh! Uh, <laughs> well, um, the conscious recall of one of the two women I interviewed, uh, this was a long time ago, roughly 19, we don't know the exact date, that's the problem. It could be 1967, it could be another date. But everything is so similar and so close between the two. It could be the same object just went up. Yeah. One of the women I interviewed, who is now in her 50s, told me that she stood, she was one of the kids at the time, got out of the car, and she's, she said the object was now out over the water, about straight out of quarter of a mile, and it did this. It was hovering over the water at some altitude, 200 feet, let's say. And she said, and it went, went to the north for Janicornis. Oh, in a matter of seconds. It stopped there, hovered there for a number of seconds, and went back to its starting point, hovered there for a number of seconds. Did this three or four times. Same starting point, same ending point each time. And then it went off towards Victoria, which is out that direction in the west. I was kind of saying, like, come along. It was almost like going, come. Well, maybe. Keep coming or something. I don't, know. I don't know what was displaying or why I was doing that. But two important points uh, that I hope that if you interviewed them, they would tell you themselves. One of the important points was that I arranged for hypnosis of this, she was a child at the time, she's now 50s, arranged for her to be hypnotically regressed uh, by a qualified <laughs> hypnotherapist. And under hypnosis, what comes out She's looking straight up underneath the bottom of this thing. It's a huge circle. Whoa. And a door opens in the bottom. That's all she can get out. She can't go beyond that. So that's where that story ends as far as her uh, memory is concerned. Her unconscious memory. The second important point, and I did quite a bit of work on this, that the Naval Air Station in this case is right about there. It's just just over the hill practically, it's much closer north. Right? There's a radar antenna for, for the air base there going around on a hill right about there, approximately, sweeping like this constantly. And every radar has a lower cutoff so that you, the people on the ground, don't get irradiated right? by microwave. These objects, whatever they were, stayed below the bottom of the radar. They wouldn't have shown up on the radar. <clears throat> Since Navy is right there, do you think it could have been a MyLab? Might have been. Looks Military abduction. Oh yeah, that's I've heard Squeer talk about that. I don't know. I'm just telling you what they told me. So that far back. Does that sound Six like a doable project? Wow. If they would be willing to talk with us, I can't imagine we could pass that up. I mean, that is so close to our area here. Uh, we could even maybe do a day trip and in, in do that in one day. Or if we had facilities to spend the night, we could do that as well. But um, it would be fascinating to be able to get both of those families uh, if they'd be willing to.
when do you think you would want to do we this? I need some lead time. time. Yeah, well, um, how much lead time would you think would be appropriate for your end? Two or three weeks. Oh, they well, might be away on travel. Yeah, yeah. Well, I think because because we have. Uh, so we're talking a month away, maybe something like that. You know, uh, that would be uh, you know, middle of May, a little May or end of May, maybe something like that. I think I'll be around. I think that would be uh, good for us, depending on the weather. Do you think that would be important? Lee, the weather would be important if we're going to do a night watch. Um, oh, I, I forgot to mention one more thing, and I think this is important. Uh huh. In this woman who was hypnotized. I asked her, did you sense any missing time? Which is a leading question, I realize. Of course. And what her answer was, well, suddenly it got dark. <laughs> oh, that's it. That says it all. Suddenly it got dark. Four words. That's enough. That would uh, indicate so some potential missing time. So how does the sun go from there time. to dark? To dark immediately. Yeah. Uh huh. Yeah. But the mothers weren't hypnotized. They no, no just this one. And why was she the only one? Uh, the older woman is pretty old by now. She's in her 80s, and I don't think she would take the stress. That's true. It's something to think about because that could be a stressful situation to be regressed hypnotically as well. But um. Wow, thank you for for that story. That's uh, right here in our backyard. And um, those uh, witnesses are still alive and potentially uh, able to uh, give us some insight. If they're willing. If they're willing. And if you could get them to re-drive that route. Now, that would be interesting, wouldn't it? It was a gravel road. It's now paved. But I was told that there was a speed limit on it, and they broke the speed limit. Yeah. <laughs> they were so intent on following that object, whatever it was. Yeah, I see. That's pretty cool that she did that. Yeah. Have you, you've probably heard of Travis Walton. Yeah, I know him. Yeah. Oh, you do? Yeah. You talk what to about him? him? Yeah, sure. Yeah. Well, you, you think that's a pretty valid... Or, it's, it's a good story. Yeah, that's a lot to say. Yeah. yeah, it's a fascinating story. Of course... Um, you you have some experience yourself, Dr. Haynes, in actually regressing folks hypnotically. Um, who would you suggest, for instance, if we um, locally run across, not necessarily these witnesses, but witnesses that were um, um, potential missing time, uh, if there was uh, candidates for re uh, hypnotic regression, would you be able to give us a referral to someone who could do that nowadays? Yes. Okay. That would be a good uh, resource for us. Mm -hmm. um, because periodically we do run across people that have blatant missing time issues. Mm -hmm. And um, sure. it'd be nice to be able to follow up somehow in that regard. Well, folks, you guys have been very quiet and, and patient, but yes, this you is your chance right now to ask Dr. Haynes your own questions. So, anybody? I'd love to ask him to sign my book. Well, isn't that nice? If he would be, let's do that. Let's 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 just tape you doing that because that's kind of a cool thing. To, this is uh, her name is Mary, by the way. Would you like it to Mary? Wonderful. Hmm? Would you like your last name or not? No. Okay. Well, I also had a question about, there's so many of these triangles that everybody's seeing. It's very interesting. I mean, I just had another gal gave me a bunch of videos. The triangles right in Snohomish and they're incredible. 50 to 100 foot size, you know. Triangles. I mean, it just seems like that's been permeating all over the place. Are they like, on YouTube and find a lot of really good videos of these things. Are they the pyramid things that, um, what was the sketch artist that you guys have? Brian Snowy's. Uh, right, yes, yeah, Snowy. So the pyramid, act, I mean, the triangle actually turned out to be a pyramid when we saw it, when the witness saw it in 3D. Yeah. But the ones you're talking about, I think, are just yeah. large, huge triangles. Yeah. yeah. Well, and Dr. Haynes has some input for us on the Belgian triangle as well. 
Um, matter of fact, I think you studied that as far as the um, photograph, uh, photo, uh, photograph of those. Right. Petite the, Fashane. Tell us about that yeah. case. That's a fascinating standard case where everybody yeah. shows those kind of blurry lights on the end scores of... Scores and scores of eyewitnesses, including gendarmerie, including pilots, including, you know, the man on the street, uh, and very controversial. Um, a photo, well, a number of photographs were taken. There are two large, in French, they're, they're Belgian-French documents. I have both got volumes that document all the interviews that were done with people and so forth, data recording, um, including color plates of the photographs that were taken, maps, background, history, and so forth. Yeah. I was asked uh, um, by one of the, ooh, it was a Belgian research organization, it's no longer in existence. I'm trying to remember the name of it. It doesn't matter, I guess. If they would send me the photograph, would I look at it and get back to them, which I did. Wow. It's a good quality color, three color uh, photograph, good resolution, and it was, it was not this. It was not an equilateral triangle. Got it. Uh, in fact, you've you've drew, you've uh, drawn it before for us on the sketch right, pad. Right, right. Okay. That's well, what you determined this is the, the, actual the shape. shape. When yeah. you look at it from underneath. First plate, yeah. home plate. <laughs> this is yeah. what it looks like That's to right. me. <laughs> home plate. It's a flying home oh, plate. <laughs> but it was right. huge. That's uh, right. Matter of fact, did you get any sense of how, uh, of course it would be hard to do, but how large these things were? Yeah. No. The best you can do is angle it. Yeah. Well, you don't know the distance. That brings up something that would be very important for you to tell us. Anybody out there who sees something unique, unidentified area phenomena, can you give us a thumbnail sketch of what they should be recording as far as the observation of this thing so they can get a decent report done on this thing? What is there any tricks don't to the tell trade? A soul. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, I don't First of all, that. Uh, in fact, I would do just the opposite. Yeah. Tell someone you love. There That's you go. The first thing to do. Get it out there and objectify it outside yourself. Don't keep it inside. Because obviously to... it creates a witness, at least for your story, yeah, very, but very I'm shortly. Psychologically now. Okay. That there's a tremendous weight, a responsibility when you have this kind of an encounter. That if you keep it inside, it's just going to fester. I think. So tell somebody who you can trust. You got to trust them that they won't go off and put it on YouTube or something. Yeah. Uh, but get it out and objectify it, right? Uh -huh. And then the second objective is what you just said. It records it, right? It documents it so you can't weasel out later on, Yeah. right? So yeah. that's the first thing I would do. The second thing, I wrote a book in the 80s on observing UFOs. And it takes the reader systematically through how do you document space, time, and intensity? Exactly. Right. Yeah. Very important to do that. So if you're out by yourself, take a pile of rocks and, and remember the exact spot you. you were. Very ah, important. very good. I like or that. Cross sticks or like something to mark where you were. Chalk dust. Yeah. Who carries chalk dust? Right. right. We all should carry chalk dust. Plaster of Paris. There you go. Like fair. Whatever. <laughs> <laughs> my, my encounter was easy because it was at the, the turn we made to go on the beach to get the Anthony's right at the Edmonds Ferry Tunnel. We didn't move from that spot. I know it. Beautiful spot. You saw something there? Oh, yeah. Yes, he did. He's got, it on, he's got a video of it as well. We'll have to show that one. Eight days. minutes. Eight minutes. I mean, I don't have the full video, but the gal that took it was a photographer, so she got the full thing. And people were getting off the ferry, going by us, getting in their cars and leaving. It was just like... But you weren't the only person to see it. No, me and Marta, yeah. And from, but nobody else? Well, when I, after I posted on MUFON, six people did come forward. I made it public, and they all said, oh, I saw the same thing. And one was in a condo, a couple in a condo, a couple people. 
milling outside. It was in downtown Edmonds about 7.45 at night. Right. They said, I saw the same thing. Another guy in a truck mm -hmm. saw. So, he, so we had about six postings after that. Was it the triangle thing you were talking about? Two of them, yeah. Oh. And at first they were about 10 feet above the ground, but the railroad tracks on the other side. That's where we were right. covering. Right. One above the other. Above the railroad track? Yeah. And we were just turning to go to dinner, and she, she turned and goes, what's that? And I looked, and then they started rising up real slowly and coming over to us. What they look like? Just just the corner lights. They're like amber. So lights. you saw three lights. Just two, well, two, two, three lights. Basically, there were six lights. Hold this up for me and show what yeah. to me, if I were you, what it would look like. Like that. Just, just kind of hovering up. Just like, like that. that. And then coming up, kind of rising up, but coming now. over to us. Okay. You know? right. The first one, which was interesting, as it got closer to us, it's like one of the lights went out. But I think what happened was it yeah. turned and the light got obscured. Right. Right. And you can only see two lights. Okay. Yeah, originally, we could see all six. What do they have the lights? Right. It's lights in the corner. What's the purpose of the light? It's a good question. Yeah. We don't know. Would, uh, would it be important to uh, try to get some kind of perspective on holding your thumb up at arm's length? You know, is it bigger than sure. your thumb? You know, that kind of thing. Yeah. The angles are better than nothing. Yeah. You know what I mean by that? As far as uh, determining how many hands above the uh, horizon, sure. maybe, or those kinds of things. Sure. Okay. I, I like to refer to stable objects like telephone poles and lines yep. that are going to be there a week later. Yeah, yeah. And if you've located your spot exactly, you go back with a theodolite and measure all those angles. You see? But if you miss it by 50 feet or 100 feet, those angles don't mean a thing. Yeah, so, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So location is important. Um, getting additional witnesses in real time if you can. But that's not always possible right. yourself. You know. Yeah, yeah. Fascinating. So Grant, Grant Cameron has a comment to say about why they have lights, uh -huh. and that is they want us to see them. Sure. Makes sense. That's a kind of a logical... Yeah. Sure. They want to be seen. I've heard him say that a couple times. Okay, what does that say about their intelligence? Are yeah. they invincible? It looks like stars. The military spent millions of dollars on camouflage. Yeah. Not to be seen. Right. Wow. If you're saying that lights are to be seen, it says something about their... Um, yeah. They're, they're not afraid. They have no reason to be afraid. Especially if they can evade any reasonable... Uh, object that we are flying so easily, they don't need lights to uh, to keep from being hit, for instance, <laughs> that kind of thing, you would think. Although, there are, you know, you've probably heard this, Dick, these airline reports of being hit by an unidentified flying really? object. Of course, really there's really bird strikes and all sorts of stuff, but I've seen some really dramatic photographs yeah, of airplanes with dented noses, the whole thing. What's your take on those? Probably birds. Uh, there have been documented bird strikes with feathers left afterwards. That's why they of course. very high altitude. Is that 30, right? 40,000 feet altitude. Some birds can fly that high. Oh my God. Yeah. People don't know that. And so if there's feathers and blood and stuff left over, that's a Yeah, yeah. And, um, would obviously a bird, even if it's a small enough bird, but if they're that that high, would would make a pretty good dent in a craft, right? Forces mass time acceleration. Isn't it? So you tell your story. Uh, I'm glad you. I'm glad I reminded you. Go ahead. <laughs> Space shuttle came back from one of its missions, or orbital missions, right? Really? Yeah, and it had a crack in the windshield. Didn't talk about it too much, but I saw the photographs of the, of the windshield with a crack in it. They did the studies on what caused it. You know what they found? What? A little speck of paint in orbit had slammed into that windshield at 15,000 miles an hour oh yeah. and caused the crack. It could have gone all the way through. Oh, man. Just a little chip of zinc oxide, I think it was, in orbit. And this was off the shuttle, obviously. The shuttle, the window. Yeah, the window. We don't window. know where it came from. Interesting. But 15,000, in other words, mass times acceleration equals force. 
Can you imagine if that was a ball bearing? They'd be dead. How, it wouldn't come back. How thick are those windows? There's uh, three panes. Three panes thick. Three panes thick. Um, yeah. I helped design the space station windows. So Did you really? It, yeah. Well, is it true that there's algae growing outside the space station windows? I saw mm -hmm. a video. I don't think so. The space station just no, I don't posted think so. it. I'm, from the last I'd be year. highly skeptical of that. From the standpoint of, infra, of ultraviolet radiation. Yeah. Stuff which is an antiseptic. Well, it was from the NASA. Okay, well, maybe they, so. I don't know. They, they posted it, so just they said so they, they went out and cleaned it off, but they didn't know how they could do that. I would say it's post-flight, it's pre-flight. Yeah. It was not mopped off before they took off. Right. That would be my guess. T tell us about your, your journey of, of Creating the space shuttle window? I mean, not the space shuttle, but this was it the Skylab you said? Space station. Space station window. Yeah. Uh, what what went into doing that, and what what human factors were you studying at that point? Well, I was chief of the space human factors office in that, in, in Moffett Field, California, and uh, it was very early in the planning stage of space station, and we were, had a, a very talented. And I worked with him, and he, you know the cupola? Have yeah. you ever seen on the space station, it's kind of a big round pentagon or octagon with windows all around and one at the top? Wow. Well, he's got the patent for that, right? Is that right? Yeah. And so he developed the framework for that to hold the glass. Yeah. Okay. And I made recommendations for the glass. The, the kind of glass, number of thicknesses, and what you put in between them, and so Really? Uh, yeah, I've got a, an article on that from NASA report. What kind of concerns were there when they were putting that glass together? In space, there's abrasion, believe it or not. Is that right? Uh, yes, there's enough crud out there to literally abrade, sandblast, if you will, yeah. okay. the exterior surface, and plus meteorites which come very low probability, but they happen. Yeah. The Soviets put middle plate, a big, if this is, okay, if this is the window and you're looking through it, right? Yeah. What the Soviets did on their spacecraft was a hinged plate, the shape of the window, of, I don't know, half inch steel or whatever. Yeah. It would literally cover up that until you wanted to look out. And when you wanted to do research or navigation or something, you'd open that up and then look out and then close up to protect them against meteorites. We didn't do that. So obviously there was some concern that, that oh, that's absolutely. a problem, so they did that. That's right. Fascinating. Yeah. Thank God for Gorilla Glass. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> and uh, the technology that was available to you at that point was, was good enough to be able to withstand whatever you needed to withstand. Sounds obviously. Like. Yeah. <clears throat> the Russians always use round windows. We, on the other hand, went in for very odd-shaped windows. The, the, LEM, the lunar excursion module that landed, yes, you know, the Tranquility Base, Apollo 11, yeah. had a triangular window. Well, if you do the analysis of the stress from a frame that holds a glass from a triangle, it puts tremendous stresses on that glass. A certain level that equal. It. You see the yeah. idea? Yeah, yeah. The Russians took the easy way. Interesting. And it was the best way. Well, yeah. Kind of... We have to practice with ovals and rectangles and squares. Oh. And... Interesting. Is that, is that the kind of the same idea, like the, the round turrets and castles, where they I missed the first part of your. Is that the same idea with round turrets on castles, with their? Um... They no, I don't. I don't think so. The, force better. the glass back then was pretty crude. So. No, I don't mean the glass. I mean the actual shape of the torus. Yeah, I, I know what you're saying because it, to deflect the the balls that I were thrown at it, uh, you know the hmm. things. I, a round thing is obviously pretty strong. So that that's yeah, exactly right. what you're talking. That's about. right. Interesting. Yeah. Okay. Sure got off service. Well, I, I've heard uh, this declassified that the Soviets also had a space lunar module and they were supposedly going to send people to the moon as well. Did yeah. that, is that true or did they ever? That's what I've heard too. Oh, okay. I don't think they did. They never did. I don't think so. That you know. Yeah. <laughs> Nothing that was publicly announced. But.
I just seen designs. Not somebody posted, a Russian scientist. Or yeah. What happens in Russia stays in Russia. That's right. So, so do you viewers on the Facebook? Facebook, question? yep. Any questions? Oh, yeah. Sure. We'll see if we can read them off the screen there with uh, Lee's yeah, closest so to it. But let me ask you this while we're, we're doing that. Is that is there any subject that we haven't come across that you would like to make sure was was covered tonight? Other than CE, we've kind of gone through that. And we've gone through some of your history at, at NASA and what you did there. I guess I would ask each of you to answer the question, what would you do to initiate contact for CE5? Ah. If you were so in, inclined to do it. Yes. What would you do? Would you wave? Would you shoot a gun? Probably the flashlight. Flashlight? Okay. Or a laser or something? Uh -huh. Now there's a point. Of course, we have to be careful with any kind of laser yeah. and in the night sky, you know, with commercial pilots uh, being uh, distracted by those images and stuff. Um, would you think that a laser um, with a CE5 kind of format would work better than just a flashlight with diffused light? Not at all. Really? No. The beam is much too narrow. Collimated. Got it. You know what collimated means. No, t tell me that. Parallel. Okay. Pencil beam. Yeah, yeah. Right? That's what a laser beam is. It's collimated. Well, right? well it's let me ask you this. Uh, if you're looking at the how collimated... Do how do you... Are you sure you're aiming at a small object in the night sky with a laser beam? You well, can't even see where it's going. Well, that's my question. Uh, looking at a laser beam from the side, for instance, like a craft might be off in the distance looking at a laser going straight. Uh -huh. Do they see it? From the side, or do you have to be the? Depends on what's in the air. Is there moisture in the air? Is there ah, dust okay. In the air? No smoke. Yeah. If there is, sure, you see it. So, but a, a diffused light from a, a flashlight would be easier seen, is what you're thinking. Well, I, no, I'm thinking at it from the object's point of view. Being being pointed at the uh, object itself. Yeah, because yeah. a flashlight at that distance might be huge, you know, and you have a much better chance of covering the object. Right? Yeah. In other words, being seen. If there was a, a way of getting the attention, uh, Morse code or what, what would you suggest would be just a simple uh, thing to try to flash at folks? Is there anything like that that you that you were, uh, have recorded? A repetitive sequence um, of letters or numbers. Or okay. flashes, dots and dashes, basically. Okay. Yeah. There you go. <laughs> so in other words, uh, long and short dashes of sure, light. Sure, repeat it. Repeat it. Okay. Repeat it. Because you got to give them a chance to get their act together, right? Yeah. Otherwise, it's just a reflection by a mirror. Or, or yeah. some automated process. We're looking for intelligence. Okay. Okay, there you go. Very good point. Yeah. Um, Okay, let me do a little summary here. This All is right. from table number 20 on page something, 422. Alleged human humanoid responses to friendly human behavior. Being waved, waved at, okay? Departing quickly, okay? Don't, they don't stick around sometimes. Yeah. Here's some responses to hostile and aggressive human behavior that initiates the contact. Beings walk or run away. These are beings now. These aren't objects. Oh, really? Got it. Yeah. A light beam or a ray emitted by the being, by oh. gun or something, yep. uh, causes neuromuscular weakness in the human, no apparent injury to the being, fog or smoke with anesthetic effects emitted by the being. Ooh. So if you're out walking in the, the nighttime and you have a close encounter, you see smoke coming out, run the other way. Yeah. According to this.